Um, when we came back from Kenya just about a year ago, uh, as Rob said, we were pretty sure we were pretty sure we weren't coming back to Kenya. Um, I was burned out, kind of classically burned out, a little bit of depression. We've been on the front line so long that we'd just taken so many hits, it was time to come back for a, a rest. And so we did, and we're back, and we're just incredibly grateful. I want to say thank you to the church for your community and your support and your friendship. When required, your words of correction, but mostly your encouragement. Thank you. If you tithe here, thank you for tithing, because this church is one of our largest financial partners. If you're our individual supporter, thank you for doing that. This is a community effort. We can't do it by ourselves. When a doctor and an engineer quit their jobs and move overseas, they can't just do that. There's no salary at a mission hospital. It requires a community, and that's you guys, so thank you. Um, our feeling at the end of this year-long home assignment is overwhelmingly one of gratitude. Marty said to me a couple of nights ago at dinner, um, I couldn't imagine this year going any better. So thanks for that. Um, I would like to speak today from the heart and just talk. Uh, my default is to go into theology because I'm very comfortable in that sphere, so just teach, right? Uh, I'm going to lay that aside if you don't mind. May I have your permission to just be myself and talk? Yeah. All right. Um, wow, I got to clap for that. That's, no pressure. Um, in the last few weeks, Rob's been doing a series on the gospel and it's been brilliant, hasn't it? Um, I can't think of a time in any church I've been in, and I grew up in the church as a pastor's kid and have been, been around a few places, where I have seen such balanced and biblical preaching on the nature of the gospel. We are an incredibly fortunate church. Incredibly fortunate. Um, so, this series has, I'm just going to review for about 30 seconds. Rob reviewed, he started off talking about sometimes we think there's a difference between Paul and Jesus' Gospels. I once heard a theologian say, oh, poor Jesus, he had the misfortune to be ministering before he fully realized the importance of his death and resurrection as a way of explaining why sometimes people say, oh, well, Paul preached the gospel of justification and this and that, and Jesus, well, he was all about the kingdom. No, no, Rob did a great job of pointing out that they're just two different sides of the story, and together we have a fuller picture. He then moved into talking about the gospel of the kingdom, how Jesus was always talking about announcing and then demonstrating the present reality of the kingdom of God, that it is here but not yet fully here. We say that Jesus, as well as um, the Jews and Paul of his day, had what's called an apocalyptic worldview. Then Rob moved into talking about following Jesus, what that entails, and information to transformation. That talk last week that was um, a clarion call to understanding that you cannot believe your way into salvation. That's not how it works. Mental assent to a series of doctrines is not the good news of Jesus. Thinking clearly and deeply is part of honestly, of just being a wise human, but there is something about transformation and action that is at the core of the gospel. He said, we know things that people are doing today in the name of spreading the kingdom are really just them participating with the world and enjoying the world with them. However, we are called to do that and to call people to repentance. 
bringing them out of the world, not being part of their system, but presenting them with an alternative, this is less evangelism and more discipleship. I summarize that with this. You can't have biblical mission without biblical ethics. You can't have biblical mission. We can't do the stuff of the kingdom without the ethics of the kingdom. God has created the world to act or to, um, to run in a particular way. Um, can, I, uh, can I shout at you for a minute? Can I, can I preach for just a minute? I know I've, I said I was going to talk, but can I preach? Rob said that he thinks thinking about the gospel and understanding the gospel is of tremendous importance. I'm going to go one step further and say I think failure to understand the good news of Jesus in the West is one of the primary reasons the church has declined in the West. N.T. Wright says it like this, most Western churches have simply forgotten what the gospel message is all about and what the Bible seen as a whole is all about. This is the story of how the Creator God launched His rescue operation for the whole of creation. As a result, the great narrative the Bible offers has been shrunk by generations of devout preachers and teachers to the much smaller narrative of me and God getting it all together. As though the whole thing, creation, Abraham, Moses, David, the early church, and not least the Gospels themselves, were simply a gigantic set of apparently authoritative teachings about how unbelievers come to faith, about how sinners get saved, about how people's lives get turned around. Of course, the Bible includes plenty about all that, but it includes it within the much larger story of creator and cosmos, covenant God and covenant people, the single narrative that, according to all four Gospels, reaches its climax with Jesus. Are we together? To summarize that, he's simply saying there's more to the gospel than what Jesus has done for you. The gospel encompasses all of creation. So the question I want to just chat about today in in a few minutes with uh, perhaps some, some food to be to be cut peaches? Produce. Produce? Produce. 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 <laughs> the question I want to briefly consider today is once we have this understanding of the gospel, as, as Rob's it, it very ably articulated over the last four weeks, how do we move beyond How do we move beyond this place where we primarily understand the gospel as something that God has done in the past and begin to understand it as something that is equally about the present and the future? How do we think about, okay, I know God did this in the past. The the death and the resurrection of Christ was a historical event. An historical event? A historical event. It happened. But what is God doing now? And I think I want to ask this question because I, I, I find in the past I have struggled with and with, with people I talk to, there is often a, a difficulty in connecting with what God's mission is today because we don't know what he wants us to do. There's this disconnect between uh, what God is doing and what we feel called to do. So, what is God's mission? What is God doing now? In Exodus 3, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Exodus 3 or read it off the screen there. I want to suggest to you that 
the question of what is God's mission is, it's all throughout Scripture, and it starts right at the beginning. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of, Jesus, out of Egypt. I want to suggest to you that the question, what is God's mission and what does he want me to do, is perhaps best understood as the Exodus paradigm. This is a phrase tossed around um, in various theological circles and, and quite common. You have probably noticed the pattern in Scripture. For many ancient Jews, history begins with the Exodus. There is some theory amongst Jewish theologians that the creation story and the bits of Scripture before the Exodus were added as kind of a backstory to the Exodus to kind of say, oh, well, you know, some stuff happened before the Exodus, and now we got here. So let's talk about what God's salvation hi history is. It's not a view shared by all theologians, but it is a, uh, it, it does point to the importance of the Exodus, particularly in Jewish salvation history. And we see throughout Scripture with the, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of references to the word Egypt, to the phrase, I heard their cry. This is throughout the Old Testament. Egypt is mentioned 44 times in the New Testament, both literally and metaphorically, referring back to the Exodus event. Throughout Scripture, this, the, the Exodus story is referred to as an example of God's character. This is what the triune God is like. He rescues those who are crying out, is what the Bible teaches us. This is a part of God's character in God's self. He is other-centered, self-giving, self-sacrificial, rescuing. This is what God is like, the Bible teaches us. When he hears the cry of those being oppressed, he acts. So I just want to suggest that God's actions in, that, in Exodus uh, and seen throughout Scripture, particularly when it comes to what is God doing today, they're paradigmatic. Um, Chris Wright says God's Exodus-shaped re redemption. We, we see the Exodus referred to in the New Testament as a paradigm for Christ's action on the cross. He rescues us. We use these terminology, right? He rescues us. He saves us. We get that terminology from Jewish history because it's something God has been doing for thousands of years. He's been rescuing his people. Chris Wright says this, and I'll continue. This redemption demands Exodus-shaped mission. Our mission derives from God's, which is expressed with exceptional clarity and repetition throughout Scripture. So, what's God doing today? I'm just going to leave that quote up there because I don't want to read it. I want to move into what's next. It's a good quote, though. What's God doing today? I've got four, four um, particularly questions like, what is the gospel? What is God doing now? Because they help us to understand that if we only, for example, if we're trying to watch Iron Man 3, thanks, Tom, if we're trying to watch Iron Man 3 on a nice television and we only have a single speaker, it's not going to play the explosions very well, is it? Maybe I should shift away from the, um, the movie analogies. 
if we're going to listen to Bach, if we're going to listen to a beautiful piece of classical music and we don't have at least two channels playing in stereo the various instruments out of various parts of the speaker, we only get part of the symphony. Yes, you're listening to Bach, but you're not getting the full song. You're not getting the beauty of the song as it's meant to be heard. And so the first speaker, I, I, I think, in the question of what is God doing today is perhaps the most easy to understand, and it's this. Part of God's work today, not just God and God's self doing it through the Holy Spirit, but through us, is this, this notion of proclamation. It's announcing the good news. And one of the things I really appreciate about Rob's uh, talk on the gospel is he pointed out we can't have gospel-shaped mission unless there's some element of proclamation in it. You can't just demonstrate the kingdom. He used the phrase, that old um, falsely attributed to St. Francis phrase, um, uh, proclaim the gospel and if necessary, use words. He pointed out the fallacy of that, that there is no demonstration of the gospel without also being able to share why you're doing what you're doing. In Romans, in the, the very beginning of Romans, Paul gives what to me is the best description of the good news of Jesus and can help us an announce it. He says in Romans, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, and here it is, wait for it, which he promised beforehand through the prophets, through the prophets, in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You want a good description of the gospel that you can meditate on, memorize, and use and have in the back of your mind when you're talking to your friends? That's a pretty good one. But remember some key words here. When Paul says the gospel, he's using the word euangelion. It's a Greek word, and it, it was employed for news that emperors would share throughout the empire if they had a proclamation to make. If there was the birth of a new emperor or the death of an existing emperor and the transfer of power in the throne, they would send out euangelion throughout the empire. They would send out a proclamation of news throughout the empire. So we, we understand what God has done in Christ as good news, but this good news is that there's a new king. There's a new ruler. There's someone that we ascribe allegiance to apart from the gods and the kings that our culture serves. When Paul says the Son of God, I need to get a bit closer here, the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by resurrection, Jesus Christ our Lord, this word Lord is kurios or kyrios. If you were a Roman and you heard that, you heard Jesus is Lord and therefore Caesar is not because Caesar was called Lord. Vespasian, all the rulers of the time, used the title Curios for themselves. So you didn't just hear Jesus is Lord and sing a song about it. It was profoundly political. So perhaps one good way to understand the gospel is the gospel is the good news that in Christ, God has done what he always promised he would do. Remember it says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures? God has done what he always promised he would do. The crucified Messiah is now the Lord of the whole world. So this first part of the gospel, this first part of God's mission now in practical terms that we 
we can either participate in or not, but God is doing it by the Holy Spirit, is announcing the good news. It's just sharing the good news. But is that all that God is doing in the world? Is God just talking about himself and asking us to talk about himself? We might be forgiven for thinking that that's true because there's plenty of emphasis on evangelism. Yeah? It, is that good? Should there be emphasis on evangelism? Absolutely! It's a crucial part. The first channel, the first channel of the speaker of the mission of God is blaring proclamation, right? It's not the only speaker in the room, though. The second speaker, and Rob talked about this a bit, is God is on about the work of transformation. God is not just, God is not just sharing that there's good news. God is transforming humanity. We use words like the forgiveness of sins. God has forgiven sins, yeah? And that's a good thing, amen? We use words like freedom. We use words like discipleship, spiritual formation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, onions are smelly. So good. Oh, the emotion. It's flowing strongly up here. He made him who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word become is the Greek word genesthe, and it is the same root as other words used for transformation in the Bible that we might become, the emphasis being there's transformation in an ongoing sense that is part of God's work. We are in the process of becoming not just like God in the sense of Christ's likeness, not just growing in Christ's likeness, sanctification, yeah? We are becoming God's righteousness, God's instruments on earth to bring about God's will. I like hearing it put this way. In Christ, God has put humans to right so that we might participate with him in putting the world to rights. Isn't that a catchy way of saying that? I like that. But the emphasis on transformation, I think, the second speaker in the room that is telling us, that is playing the music of God's what God is doing today is the reality that God is about the business of transformation. When you declare allegiance to Christ as Lord, when you give mental assent to the reality of Christ, which is tremendously important to have that conversion process, we believe in that, yeah? yeah. Tremendously important. You begin something, you don't end something. And the transformation is a lifelong process. So that's the second speaker in the room. Transformation. God is on about the business of moving people from point A in their lives to point Z. Some people call that becoming more fully human. Becoming the kind of human that God intended from the garden for us to be. I love that thought. So a third speaker, a third speaker in the room that draws from the good news that Jesus is now the curios of the whole world, he's now the Lord of the whole world, is that in Christ's kingdom, with a new ruler, comes a new set of rules. God is always offering shalom. He's always offering peace and freedom where there is chaos and destruction. We have a lot of destruction in, our, in the lives of, shoot, in our lives at times, but in the lives of people around us, don't we? I recently walked through a friend's divorce with him and it was one of the most painful things I've ever experienced, watching the destruction 
of a marriage. Uh, it had to happen, and it did, and it was ugly, just plain ugly. It was destruction. And in the midst of that, because he was committed to Christ, I watched in the midst of destruction, God, by his Holy Spirit, bring peace and new life over a 12-month period. God is in the business of taking the chaos and the destruction that we create and bringing peace out of it. Isn't that good news? So, that's, if that's God's mission, if that's what God is on about, I think it's helpful. I find it personally helpful to understand that if I'm asking the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is my call? What are you, what do you want me to do today, God? Like when we came back from Kenya 12 months ago and laid aside our ambitions and laid aside our calling and our passions and said, I don't know what to do next, Lord. Will you show me? One of the answers to that question is God is always bringing shalom and new life and freedom out of chaos and destruction. If you want to know what you should do, and there is that ar around you in the lives of family members and friends, to the extent that it's wise, please don't be a fool about this and go looking for battle un unprepared for it. Yeah, can I say that? So we'll add the don't be stupid caveat. Be wise. The book of Proverbs is in the Bible, yeah? God is always wanting you to be his agent where there is chaos and destruction. You are his agent in that sense. And we've got Jesus' um, initial proclamation of his arrival from Luke 4.18 to, to teach us about that. The fourth speaker in the room, how are we doing on time? Sorry? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie it up now. The fourth speaker in the room is God's defeating of death and evil. You know what I really need? I need some limes. Does anyone have any limes? Are there any limes in the house? Oh, thank God, I knew there would be. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Talk about miracles. One of the fourth, the fourth speaker in the room is the reality that God has come in Christ to defeat death and to defeat evil, both in a final sense and in an ongoing sense. Are you with me? We use words like liberation, redemption, restoring. In 1 John 3, 8, it says the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And this is good and helpful. But I think one of the things that we, particularly as Protestant evangelical Christians, struggle to do is to understand that sin is not just personal. Sin is always moving into the societal and the systemic from the personal. When sin gets ahead of steam, it's not just the implications on humanity are not just the result of choices one person makes, but of sin that has become embedded in society. Marty, would you share a story with us about that? After we had lived in Kajabi for about a year, I had seen a lot of sick kids, a lot of kids who got better, a lot of kids who came in really sick and then got better, a lot of kids who came in sick and then died. But I was doing medicine, I was looking after children and, and it had ceased to be shocking to me until the morning when I met Ava. Ava was nine months old and 3.5 kilograms.
she came in with pneumonia and sick and I was called to see her and we just looked at her and first of all, how can a baby this old who should be chubby and delicious look like this little skeleton? And it turned out she had pneumonia and we did some more tests and it turned out she had advanced AIDS. There was nothing that we could do for this little girl. How does a little girl like this get so sick? We delved a little deeper into her story. She'd been brought in by her Maasai mother. Her Maasai mother, who was 17, Ava was her third child. Her Maasai mother, who'd been married at 13 as the fourth wife to her pastoral husband. She'd never received an education past much of primary school and she was married when she was told to be married and she had children when she was told to have children. She had two other children who were older than Ava who were actually the picture of health. Somewhere along the line, HIV had come into this family. Ava's mum is the fourth wife. And so part of what we did was talk to the mum about Ava's got HIV advanced. We need to test you as well. And it turned out that mum, of course, had HIV. So we started her on medications, but we thought we should ask her about contraception too, because if there's more children, this will also be the story. That wasn't a question that Ava's mum was allowed to ask her husband, and she ref respectfully declined to even talk about it. A young mum, married at 13, uneducated, unable to have a voice, poor access to health care. We didn't keep Ava in the hospital. We gave her some medications, we snuggled her up. She went home with mum and dad. What happened to Ava? And um, what, does, what does a missionary do at Kajabi Hospital as part of a team to participate with God in God's mission of destroying evil? and death, in a sense. We have compassion. We love. We put our arms around the mums and we cry with them. Sometimes we act, sometimes we give medicines, sometimes we do, sometimes we do and we see miracles. We pray, we pray for the family, we pray for healing, and I have seen it happen, but not in Ava's case. We try and teach people to go out to the communities and to love and to have compassion and to give medicines and to teach and to empower. We work with the Bible College next door, and we try and teach pastors who will go out and live in those areas and bring Jesus to those areas on a permanent basis. Mm -hmm. And we partner with the local church. And when they say, we've got people out in the rural areas and we want to send a mission, we would say, we'll go with you. Hmm. Thank you for that. One of the specific ways that um, Moffat Bible College and the Africa Inland Church, the Kenyan Protestant denomination that we work with in Kenya alongside the Vineyard does is uh, they have a focus on planting churches and mentoring pastors in Maasai pastoral areas. Because one of the primary ways to be the gospel, to participate with God in God's mission of um, destroying sin and death and the powers of evil in this particular context is for a church to do the long and slow work of demonstrating the ethics of the kingdom of God. One man for one woman. Respect your wife, the profound dignity of the individual. These are all Christian values, yeah? They don't come from secular humanism. They come from Christianity. So the, the long, slow work of planting churches and mentoring and uh, building churches in these communities, acknowledging that God is, a, God, God is a missionary God. God is a God of accommodation. Throughout history, God has accommodated polygamy, concubines, divorce. Are you with me? Let's be, let's be real about these things, yeah? God accommodates these things historically because he is a missionary God. Are they his ideal? 
No, God hates divorce. It's real, right? It's real. But God loves and God comes to us where we're at. So, for example, in the specific case of the Maasai and polygamy, the Africa Inland Church takes the position, hey man, we often, we understand that polygamy, is act, having multiple wives, is actually a great way to take care of widows. So if you take the wives of your brother if he dies, that's a great way to prevent a family from falling into poverty, genuinely. Like it's been part of these societies for thousands of years. Uh, however, in the long term, if you want to be an elder in this church, an elder or a pastor, consider, um, if you're a young man, only having a single wife. So they, they uh, accommodate culture, because it's not inherently evil to have multiple wives, until it is. Don't, don't get me started on this. <laughs> this is a different cultural conversation here than it is in my context where all the students want to talk about is speaking in tongues, alcohol, and polygamy. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Those are four speakers. And one of the things, if we use the analogy of speakers or if we, we use the analogy of ingredients in a recipe, one of the things that I want to encourage you with today is God is, if we think of the first speaker, say, as a tomato, and the second, the second example of God's mission as an onion, and the third example as a little bit of chili, and the fourth example is maybe a little bit of lime juice and some cilantro. No one thing that we just talked about is the only thing that God is doing in the world around us. They're ingredients in a larger recipe. The takeaway is God is always making salsa. He's always making salsa, and it's delicious, so pass it around. I'm good. You, you're good? Well, I'll, I'll hand, hand it. You, you, you can pass it around. Get some of the salsa. I make good salsa. <laughs> God is always making salsa. Why do I want this to stick with you? Because if you're anything like me, you will repeatedly and regularly ask yourself the question, Lord, what do you want me to do, and is my work of any value. And if you remind yourself, God is always making salsa. God's not only producing tomatoes. Evangelism is hugely important, but you can't have a tomato-only salsa. That would be tomatoes, <laughs> not salsa, because tomatoes... God is always on about the complete work of the kingdom and calls us to participate in it in specific ways. There's nothing preventing you from making salsa with God. Nothing. So I want to, I want to close and just invite you to consider, if you're struggling with, oh, I don't know what to do, or there's... I've got this passion, and I want to I wanna act on it, but I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's uh, uh, gosh, is my skill the right skill to use here? Honestly, the older I get, the more I think those questions just don't even matter. Who cares what your skills are? God's always making salsa. Just do the thing that fits. Are you good at tomatoes? Cut up some tomatoes. Just be good at evangelism. It's not the whole story. It's part of the story. Are you with me? Take the burden off to have to do a particular thing and participate with God in making salsa. Chris Wright says, the Bible renders and reveals to us the God whose creative and redemptive work is permeated from beginning to end with God's own great mission, his purposeful, sovereign intentionality. All mission which we initiate or into which we invest our own vocation, gifts, and energies flows from the prior and larger reality of the mission of God. God is on mission, and we are his co-workers. God is always making salsa. You're not making salsa. It's not your mission. I don't like the word mission, and I do not describe myself as a missionary. Part of that is cultural. Part of that is the post-colonial heritage of missions in Africa. But part of it is, first of all, the word mission is not used in Scripture. 
Did you know that? <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> it's not a bad thing, but it's just not there. God is doing work because of who God is, and he calls us to participate with him. So can we close with, with a song and some prayer? Do you, feel, do you feel like there's something preventing you from working with God in a particular area? And you've felt this burning inside you to do something, or a question inside you, man, I just don't, uh, I'm not participating with God in a way that, that I think I should be. Whatever is blocking you from acting on that, come up and renounce it to the Lord. Do it in your seat, do it up here, it doesn't matter. God's always making salsa. There's so many ways to work with God in making salsa. Amen?